Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The 1960s saw the true birth of international air travel. The glamour of the jet set was only matched by the glamour of the flight attendants that cared for them as they dashed across the globe. At the forefront of this change in air travel were Pan American Airways and their powder blue uniformed stewardesses. But while a highly sexualized image of these women was popularized and even advertised by the airlines themselves, the reality saw these pioneering women at the forefront of feminism, women's working relations, and even war. In her new book, Come Fly the World, author Julia Cook looks at the women of Pan Am and looks at that world of the late 60s and early 70s through their eyes. There was only one place to start with my discussion with Julia, and that was what drew her to the stories of these women. So I came at the subject um, in a very weird kind of offhand way that on the one hand is incredibly natural, and on the other hand makes very little sense. Um, My dad worked for Pan Am as an attorney until I was nine. So I grew up very steeped in the culture, which for us was really much more just about um, total spontaneity of travel. You know, we were, we hopped on the plane all the time when I was a kid and traveled to any place where there were free seats um, on any airplane. So my parents would pack us for either hot or cold um, and we'd go to JFK and see what happened which was a really interesting and cool way to grow up. My husband at some point noticed that I I talked about Pan Am a lot. And so when I was casting around for my next, my second book idea, my first book was about youth culture in Cuba. Um, He suggested something having to do with Pan Am. I started attending um, events occasionally that were held by the Pan Am Historical Foundation. Uh, The first big one that I went to was actually held at the TWA terminal in New York at JFK. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? No, I'm. I've never been to New York. Really? Uh, that sounds terrible. I'm, but we're going in May, okay, so we've good. just literally booked up. So I'm. I'm going to JFK, and I'm going to be spotting. I'm going to be really geeky. Yes. So the TWA terminal at JFK is one of the most beautiful buildings that still exists from the 1950s. It's absolutely stunning. It's like a cathedral to the kind of the notion of um, of space and the jet age and and the optimism of it. Um, And I really had just wanted to see the building actually. So when the Panama Historical Foundation held an event there, um, I went. Uh, Throughout the whole event, I wound up speaking for the most time uh, with two women who, when I called them flight attendants, corrected me very stridently and said, darling, we we were stewardesses. Please call us stewardesses. Um, and I uh, was I was captivated by them. Uh, they were really unlike anyone I'd ever met before in my life. They talked about geopolitical history as if they'd had martinis or tea with the main actors the night before. Um, they could name drop the best shopping locations, but then also really gritty. Um, events of geopolitics that were, they really seemed to unite these two poles of both sophistication and, you know, kind of being at ease in the world, but also like a knowledge base that I found fascinating and really compelling. Um, I also, I offered a ride home to one of them from JFK when I left. And um, she said, yes, that she never bought a return ticket on any plane or train because darling, you never know. And I just, I love that attitude and um, everything about the way that she seemed to interact with the world just was incredibly compelling to me. So I wanted to know everything about these women and how they became who they were and um, the kind of authority that it seemed like they moved through the world with. Um, so I, I, that's how I came at the story. Just thinking about my time working for an airline, if I'd called a flight attendant a stewardess, I probably would have gotten the opposite reaction to that. Well, and I found it really interesting because, you know, I I am as feminist as they come. Um, And for these women who seemed to me to be incredibly um, feminist, you know, they they seemed very strident about who they were um, and and their ability to move through the world with, with, like I said, this sense of authority. For them to be correcting me and saying that they wanted to be called stewardesses, I found to be kind of an interesting contradiction, which later I understood, um, you know, in their minds, that that um, that word attached them to the historical accuracy of a job that no longer exists in the incarnation in which they performed it. Um, so to them, it's a matter of respect. Right. That said, 
most of the women who worked from the era of stewardess into the era of flight attendant, which is basically the the late 60s into the early 70s, late 70s, 80s, um, absolutely uh, will will prefer to be called flight attendant. Um, So it it, it really was a matter of, um, of historical accuracy. Speaking of historics, there will be some of my listeners who don't remember a time when Pan Am was around. Um, so let's, before we start delving into the book and, and the, the wonderful women that you introduce us to, could you give us a potted history of what was the most remarkable airline that no longer exists? Okay, to, to my English listeners, there's going to be people shouting about BOAC and Imperial, but in my mind, yeah. You know, Pan Am was the, the thing. No, and BOAC and Pan Am were, you know, were, were running parallel games um, across the Atlantic. Pan Am was um, the U.S.'s first and for a very long time only exclusively international airline. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, it, it was an airline of firsts. It was These firsts were both cultural and technological. It was the first American airline in the 1920s to operate permanent international flights, to use radio, to serve meals in the air. In the 1930s, it was the first to operate scheduled transatlantic passenger service. In the 40s, it was the first to run a round-the-world flight to provide tourist class service outside of the U.S. Um, it was involved in the first of the jet age. It, it just the, the list goes on and on. It was... Um, Speaking of the UK, the first to bring the British invasion to the shores of the US, <laughs> they flew the Beatles um, into the US. Which people don't uh, think. They so, think it was BOAC, but it's a you see them on the steps no. and it's Pan Am. Yeah, well, and so so they became really associated with glamour, um, in part because so many celebrities would fly Pan Am uh, because they needed to fly internationally. And Pan Am was um, among the only singular airlines that would connect all of these different places. Um, so. At the same time, in parallel, it was uh, involved in all of the U.S. um, conflicts abroad um, because Pan Am had always been really involved in U.S. government dealings because one trip cultivated special relationships and indeed a degree of American reliance on the airline. He called the airline the chosen instrument for the implementation of the national interest abroad. Um, say, 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 say that after a martini. <laughs> I know, right? The cho- shorten it to the chosen instrument. Um, no, so he, you know, and, and this, this interrelation with the U.S. government um, is huge. And I think often for contemporary um, thinkers or, or people who are t- thinking about the jet age, we, we do remember things like Elvis Presley or the Beatles or, you know, these famous people flying on, on Pan Am, but we often forget that um, Pan Am was really involved in politics. CIA agents used to stop by the Pan Am ticket office in foreign countries before they would go to the U.S. Embassy. FDR called one trip the most fascinating Yale gangster he'd ever met. <laughs> um, so, you know, and Pan Am was integral in the World War II effort via the Lend-Lease Act by constructing and renovating airfields across Africa um, in order to defend the Americas against invasion by the Axis powers. Uh, it, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, so yeah, it was it, Pan Am was important. And one trip himself, we were talking about him before. There's sort of parallels with some of our mercurial men today. He he really was out front and center. He was Pan Am, wasn't he? He he, the ability that he really he had to was be just almost. It felt like it was he was a step ahead of everyone for such a long time. Yeah, he was, and it's interesting because it, it, you know, between Pan Am and Howard Hughes, and between these, you know, the, these huge personalities that were very much um, involved in both, like I said, like the government side of things um, and the cultural side of things. They hobnobbed with um, celebrities and and famous people, and and so it, it created of airlines a really glamorous, important world. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about that world. So your book, Come Fly the World, which I just thoroughly enjoyed, but it's it's this fascinating decade, sort of in the, the middle 60s to around about 75, 76, when, when you start wrapping it up. And you've got this group of women who I, you can't help but fall in love with. How, how did you find... Lynn and Tori and Karen and Hazel and Claire, because I didn't want you to stop telling their stories because they just seem like the most remarkable women. 
I'm so glad you think that. Um, I, that's what I felt about them. So the reporting for this book really, it, it, um, to put it kind of crassly, involved me crashing a lot of parties. Um, I went to a lot of uh, reunions. So one thing to keep in mind about this group of women is that they're incredibly international. They're very tight knit um, and they really enjoy each other's company. So they, they stay in touch. They've stayed in touch over the years, in part because so few people outside of, of Pan Am really understand the way that they lived um, in their 20s and 30s, for mostly some flew for a really long time, which just increases the insularity. Um, so all of this means that they they get together a lot. They really make an incredible effort to um, find each other and um, have reunions and luncheons. And and I got to go to a lot of them. Um, they World Wings. That, that, that sounds that sounds so tough. I, it was it was a real challenge. <laughs> it was just horrible. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was fantastic. It was awesome. I got to go to um, Thailand to one of their reunions um, and, you know, a lot of events in New York um, and a lot in California. Um, so that, that was it was really exciting. They were very gracious to me. I found the primary women that I wound up featuring in the book um, because uh, in part because a lot of them were very generous about their own contacts and their friend groups. Um, you know, once it became clear to them that I was much more interested in talking to them about uh, the geopolitics and the the degree to which they were um, they were really participating in uh, the cultural history that was happening in the '60s and '70s, um, I was not just interested in in shopping or celebrities or um, or sex, honestly, because those uh, those elements of their story have been told before. They really got excited to send me to friends of theirs that they knew had interesting stories to tell me. Um, so, you know, one woman would say, oh, you've got to talk to this person. Uh, let me pass you along her, her email address or phone number. And I just interviewed tons and tons of women. I knew that I wanted all of the women in the book, or most of them at least, to um, be on a single flight together. Um, I wanted them to have met up at some point. And I also knew that I wanted them to really represent a big variety of the different experiences that um, that women uh, had had on Pan Am, different reasons to join up on the airline, different um, things that propelled them through the decade, different places of the world that they were interested in. Um, and I was able to find find a group of women that, that kind of seemed to fit, fit that bill. I've specifically tried to make my questions so that we don't spoil the book so because i i'm I'm really really keen for people to read it because these these really are fascinating women so we're we're gonna sort of tease them i think is the best way to put it because we want people to buy the book sounds great but um let's let's get in get into it so i'd i spent many years working for an airline i once or twice stupidly volunteered for the restraint training where they basically beat me up and and things which was not nice, but what was Pan Am's criteria for selecting their cabin crew? Because it's even though it's was a long time ago, there was lots of elements that I saw familiar from my time in the airlines because they they really were sort of setting setting a model, weren't they? That's so interesting to hear, and and I would love to hear more about how it's what the parallels with today are actually. Um, T- today, it's uh, been a, it's been a while since I've been out of the game. But <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Um, so it, the, the, the criteria back then were, um, very weirdly, uh, contradictory on the one hand, they were incredibly sexist. Um, women were, first of all, had to be women. Um, they had to be young, unmarried, under 26 at the time of hire. Uh, they had to be slim and really conventionally beautiful. They could be fired if they turned 35 or got married. And this is all pre-1970. Um, over the course of the 60s, these regulations were challenged in, in the courts, um, these specific parameters, and, and really fell away, But um, which, which is part of the reason why I was very interested in the women who had been hired in the early 60s, mid-60s, um, and who worked through this period of huge change in not only the airline industry, but also the U.S. at large. So we've got these incredibly sexist job requirements, but then also on Pan Am in particular, 
the requirements were incredibly um, intellectually rigorous. They had to be very qualified and smart. They had to have gone to college. They had to speak two languages fluently. They had to be able to think on their feet. They were quizzed on their ability to, to think on their feet and you know address needs um, of customers, totally varied needs. Because remember, most people in this era had not flown on an airline before. The airplanes were very, very new. So they had to really be able to um, be diplomats um, and and to calm down unruly or very frightened passengers. The the one one statistic, there are a couple of statistics that I think really encapsulate the the preparation and intellectual qualities that were these women represented. Um, which is first of all that um, this is just to speak to how hard it was to get a job in the inter- in the airline industry in the U.S. Airlines in that era only hired about three percent of their applicants. Um, and that on Pan Am in particular, in an era in which only six to eight percent of American women uh, went to college, graduated from college, a full 10 percent of women on Pan Am had gone to graduate school. So these were women who were um, hugely overqualified for their jobs um, in some way. And in other ways, they were the exact perfect people for the job that would wind up putting them in many more positions of um, authority and danger than um, you might otherwise think. It's the, the, the parallels that are interesting was, you know, I, I, I worked for a, a BA franchise for, for many years and a lot of the training, you know, the, the things like the making of the drinks and stuff like that, the service element that you, you talk about as well, paralleled with my early days there, it all dropped off when things went low cost. But the, mm-hmm. um, the crew selection elements of physique, you know, the, the, the classic beauty elements and you describe what, a cl- you know, what they considered a classic beauty. I saw when I then consulted and was in India working with some airlines that they had still had that. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, it, it just made me th- stop and think, wow, you know, it, the, there's some of these sort of baseline odd, what we would now consider odd and, and sexist characteristics that, that are still being used for the, image of a flight attendant that um, a lot of airlines still have. Totally. I mean, and, and, you know, back then it was, it was all because they, uh, you know, airlines could not compete for passengers based on price. Um, the prices in the U S were all fixed by the government. Um, and so airlines were really competing based on perks and luxury and image. And a woman, um, who was serving passengers was a huge part of that image. You know, um, airlines in the U S really wanted their passengers to, to think of their, their, stewardesses as potentially available, which is why they were allowed to be fired after they got married or um, certainly could not get pregnant. Um, so, you know, the, the, that they wanted, they really wanted the women to be a lure for new passengers. Um, and, uh, and I think a version of that remains the same today and in, in some countries and on some airlines. Definitely. You've got in your book, what are the, um, recruitment posters from it that's got that wonderful tag of stewardesses wanted must want the world and i i just thought that that was such a interest interesting way of putting it because what what was the sort of expectation for young ladies in in the states in the 60s because we're, we're talking about women in their sort of early 20s that are the, the demographic that pan am are going after isn't it yeah you know this is this is the thing that I realized um, that I found so compelling about about these women and this job and this period of time is that, you know, I just mentioned that they were really seen as sex objects or they wanted, you know, airlines wanted passengers to be able to see them as, as um, you know, their potential objects of flirtation or desire. And so that would make us think of them as, as victims or mere objects. Um, and yet these women were also in positions of incredible agency. Um, you know, this was an era of time in which um, women's jobs were really rather limited to um, secretary, teacher, 
nurse, librarian, or housewife. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking about just uh, what is widely socially acceptable. I'm, I'm talking about for for a woman who doesn't want to be, you know, say the only woman in her law school class, or pushing her way through the halls of of medical school. These were really the um, widely socially acceptable roles. Um, and then along comes this other job, stewardess, which is also widely socially acceptable for a young woman, but which offers you the ability to travel around the country or the world um, and to, you know, to, to not only see these other places, um, which is fascinating in and of itself, but also to see who you were in these other places to kind of test yourself against these different boundaries. This is what we forget a lot of times about travel, that it's not just about seeing um, another place or, you know, transposing your, your location to a different location. Um, it, it's also about, you know, seeing who you are in these places. So that, that sense of um, self-exploration was completely unique to this job. Um, and on Pan Am, at least, that was something that they really wanted in their stewardesses. They wanted women who valued um, and who were excited to, to get out into the world and to see it and um, test things out. So I, I loved that catchphrase, the, the stewardess wanted, must want the world. I thought that just encapsulated um, that kind of challenge that was being posed to these young women. We've kind of touched on it because the, the the training school that that you sort of feature in the down in, down in Florida seems like it's it's as much finishing school as it is training school, isn't it? I found that oddly odd, if 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 you know what I mean. That there is this getting the aesthetic right, but also having them trained in the safety aspects as well. It, it seemed that from how you described it, there was this very strange sort of smushing of, of two very different worlds to, to prepare the, the stewardesses for their roles. Totally. Looking at these training documents is on the one hand, like it's, it's fascinating as a historical document. It's also maddening um, <laughs> when you think about, I mean, I, when I, at least as a woman think about, you know, the being expected to, you know, know exactly what color of eyeshadow is going to complement your eyes and, you know, be most aesthetically pleasing to the people who are looking at you. Um, but also, you know, they were teaching these women about the physics of airplane flight because, like I said, so few people had actually flown before that they they really wanted these women to understand everything about the job that they were performing. So they had to do, you know, tons of safety um, mechanisms, but also understand how planes got through the air. So they, they took these crash courses in physics, um, which was incredible for me to see, you know, on Pan Am, at least another one of the things that really fascinated me was um, Pan Am's involvement, like I said, in, in diplomacy. And these training books really hit it so hard. Um, they wanted these women to understand um, the differences in hierarchy between, you know, the Roman Catholic Church and um, the other churches, and how they should be properly addressing any kind of passenger, whether they be diplomats from foreign countries, or clergy, or American politicians, or foreign royalty, or politicians. And you know, they had to understand these different cultural um, norms and how to how to how to treat different people from different countries with respect and dignity. So, you know, the, on the one hand, the 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 training program was just incredibly it could be seen as quite demeaning in terms of you know creating a homogenous, um, very corporatized feminine look. Um, and on the other hand, just fascinating. I, I love I love that, but I I'm a fan of the book, so I'm going to keep saying that. But let's let's get on. So once <laughs> once the um, the trainee stewardess has has reached the line, they're, they're out flying, and, and it's you know the, the the bid system where you have to work your way up to get the good routes and things like that still still exists in 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 the big in the big carriers now. But for a Pan Am stewardess, it's an international carrier, so immediately they're they're seeing in you know going to far-flung places for the most part what sort of routes were they flying and, and what were they what was the service that they were offering because i guess for many people service on an airplane is they expect it to be non-existent that was not the case back in the day yeah it was not at all the case the service was incredible um there were flights you know fl flights between New York and Paris were the menus were devised by one of the most famous restaurants in Paris um and and 
the service was incredibly luxurious. There were round the world flights, um, different on different flight branches. Uh, the the culinary offerings were kind of tailored to match the different places that they were flying to. So you know, um, a lot of the women that I talked to still have recipes for what they call Tokyo dressing, which was the the ginger salmon dr- the ginger salad dressing that they would serve on flights to to Japan. Um, so you know that that kind of thing um, really, really distinguished Pan Am from other airlines. Um, but it was a very luxurious service. And, and the flights would take them um, either in a loop around the world um, with flights that were connecting from one place to the other, or there were other routes through, for example, um, from the east coast of the US across Africa, which would then backtrack um, through Liberia and often Portugal, and then back to New York. And um, that was another really interesting thing for me to look at how over the course of the late 60s and early 70s, as you know, the geopolitical situation was changing very rapidly, to watch the flight routes also change um, with a certain level of, of responsiveness to what was happening, and less so in the 60s and 70s, more so in the 50s and 60s, when decolonization was really um, taking hold, and, and different airline, different countries were creating their own airlines. And it was, it was fascinating. My grandparents did around the world on Pan Am. It's so cool yeah. to think about. I, when I was reading your book, it popped back into my head because they 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 were living yeah you know, they're Winnipeg, so they went down to New York, spent some time in New York, and then went to the east, and yeah, you know, just stops along the way that was all part of the the ticket was just yeah. They still talked about it. Well, and airlines still do that. You know, I remember when I was backpacking in in South America when in my early 20s, I met a lot of people who had purchased around the world flights on on specific airlines. And, you know, it's it's different now, but there is a a similar kind of spontaneity and um, excitement to linking up flights around the world. Yeah, I I don't think the martinis are of the same standard. That's for... That's for sure. Based on, I don't think there are martinis anymore. <laughs> cold, cold gin or cold vodka is probably going to be about as, as as good as you're going to get, but as close as you're going to get it. <laughs> We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello, folks. I'm Zach White, chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Charity. We're a new organisation that honours the veterans of the period 1775 to 1815. What many don't realise is that those who died in conflicts before 1900 are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being excavated, but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes' bodies are lying in cardboard boxes, their sacrifice forgotten. At the NRWGC, We're changing that, restoring graves and giving these veterans the dignity of a proper burial. So if you feel that the war dead deserve this basic respect, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com, to find out more about our aims, how you can donate, and the perks of being a member. Thank you. So how how did the travelling, in your interviewing and and, and chatting chatting with with the women how did the traveling affect them what you know did it did it change them did it change their outlook on things or absolutely profoundly you know for each of the women that i I spoke with it 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 actually really impacted them in very different ways Um, on some level in the same way in that they had all signed up to fly on pan am because you know unilaterally almost every single person i interviewed said that they the, the same a version of the same Thing, which was that quote, I wanted to see the world. Um, so, you know, on, on some level, they were ready for the, that experience of seeing the world to change them. Um, and they were already committed to that, that kind of outlook when they arrived at the airline. Um, for some of them, you know, it, that, that globalism really impacted their politics. Uh, one woman that I talked to started out as a pretty hawkish right-wing type person um, who, you know, she could not be confronted with um, both the, the global conflicts um, and, you know, the, the way that so many people around the world were so similar um, without really shifting her political views toward a much more um, leftist, internationalist um, perspective. Um, so I think isolationism can't really get that far when you're when you're spending so much time with so many different people from so many different places. 
I think that for some of the women, uh, Lynn, Lynn had a forever career um, in something international. She met a man, not while flying, but um, she wound up marrying an international man um, and, and living in various places um, around the world over the course of her life. So she, she never exited that international sphere, even if she only worked for Pan Am for seven years of her life. Um, Karen wound up you know, being a real um, entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur sort of. Um, she was wanderlusty in her mind um, in, in a, at almost as much as she was in her physical pursuits. So like it, 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 it's, it's, um, it really, it changed them forever. And I think for a lot of them, they really, it, it shaped their social worlds forever. Um, I, I think it's really hard after you live that kind of peripatetic lifestyle to, to go back to a single place and pretend to, um, really fit in with people who haven't lived that kind of a life. So they, a lot of them, like I mentioned before, wound up staying in very close contact with each other um, and and stayed for lifelong friends, which actually is one thing that I, I really, um, as a woman in my early 30s, when I was working on this research, um, it really changed the way that I started investing in my female friendships. Um, I, I really started spending a lot more time kind of trying to maintain older relationships um, in part because I saw them working so hard at maintaining theirs and the kind, the way that that really, um, I think, I think made their lives as older women so much better. That's really interesting that you can sort of see that long-term bond and, and wanting to, to, to ensure you had a, a semblance of it yourself. That, that's a really interesting takeaway from, from your experience. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they were, these women, when you meet them, like, I, I'm really glad that you thought that they were remarkable women um, and that you got that from the book. I thought they were very much so. I, I think they still are. Um, a number of them, you know, over the course of the pandemic, were taking online Harvard courses. They're really lifelong learners. Um, they, uh, the, the degree to which they're still really engaged with one another and the world at large um, was something that I, I find I find it to be incredible in any person, but even more incredible in 70 something year old, 80 something year old women who, you know, the level of satisfaction that I um, got from them in their lives and self-actualization that I saw, um, I found really inspirational. Yeah, the the thing that I got from the book is, you know, they realized the opportunity and they just grabbed it with both hands and experienced it in totally. every way they could. Yeah. They are truly remarkable ladies. Um but they, yeah, they're living in a very int interesting. I don't know if that's right because you know the sixties. You have hypersexualization of of a of a way that probably hadn't been realized even even since the twenties. And you know, we you should talk about it in the book about how you have sort of the battles of the different types of politics. You have the the coffee, tea, or me book, which was which was written by a guy and not the stewardesses he he pretended that it was, which was which was interesting. But the bit that really drew me in was how, while this is going on, you've got airlines putting stewardesses in cat suits and things like that, but you have the women themselves unionizing, fighting for better prospects, promotions to supervisory and managerial roles within the airlines. Yeah. Was, was that a sort of universal thing amongst them or was there a little bit of conflict in there between those who didn't see it as as their role to try to progress out you know it, it, part of what was so interesting about writing this book is that it really made me think a lot about um the variety of different experiences of the same thing mm -hmm. um so you know you're you're, you're discussing cat suits or let's say hot mm -hmm. pants right the hot pants on um, southwest airlines that's what a lot of women really resented being pressed to um you know, overtly sexualize their bodies for um, the corporate good or for, for male pleasure. Um, and they, they took to the courts um, in order to, you know, have to be able to wear more dignified clothes or, you know, took to the courts in order to um, be able to get married and keep working or not get fired and, and when they turn 35. And, and, you know, that, that legislation happened because of the US EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, which offered a venue for 
um, those complaints to be funneled um, toward the government and, and, and legal precedent that allowed a lot of those lawsuits to be successful. Those lawsuits changed the face of labor history um, and changed the way that women in the workplace were treated. So they, they were really pioneering and revolutionary women. There were women for whom, you know, wearing hot pants felt like liberation um, to them, you know, and that that's also, I think, a valid um, perspective, uh, wearing hot pants could feel good. Um, and, and that's, that's also true. So uh, to, to understand that, um, these, these two realities could exist at the same time, um, and among the same crew even was, was really interesting to me. It hot pants never look I've been able to pull off personally, but uh, it works for some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, the, I'm, I'm being very wary of asking this question, but the, um, the, the way that feminists at the time viewed the the role and not what they were doing and were sort of attacking the women as stewardesses as being not fem- feminist because they were doing this role that was seen to be hypersexualized that was a very interesting um, section of the book about the the idea of because you're a stewardess therefore you're not you're not trying to lift 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 women up and there was that great quote that that said um i've got to hear that I, I don't think of myself as a sex symbol i think of someone who knows how to open the door of a 747 in the dark upside down and in the water i just that that blew me away because that was just the, the ultimate retort for oh you're just someone who serves drinks yeah i mean it's interesting because um what what you're saying about the the kind of testy relationship between the feminist movement and the stewardesses themselves. I also found that fascinating. Um, Gloria Steinem famously was um, very much a supporter of stewardesses um, and, and their pursuit of women women's rights. I think she saw in them the potential for um, a, a massive rebellion, which actually did wind up happening. Um, at the same time, a lot of the women who were working the job were working it for their own personal reasons um, because they wanted to travel. Um, they wanted to, to experience these different places in the world and, and themselves, which I think is also valid. One of the things that this book really shifted in my mind, that my research for it really shifted, um, is uh, the notion of what is and is not selfish for a woman to pursue. Um, mm-hmm. Lynn told me very early on in our interviews that, you know, she really considered her, um, at first when she signed up for Pan Am, she felt like it was a selfish choice that she was making, that she was prioritizing her own desire to to travel and to see the world over what she thought might have been a better thing to do for humanity or for, um, for, for other people. She, her friend, one of her friends thought she should be a social worker. Um, I think in her mind, she thought of, um, having a family, having, having kids as being less selfish than, um, becoming a stewardess. Now, I don't know about you, but to my eye, um, offering a dignified service to, uh, traumatized soldiers on their way out of a war, um, or a load of refugees that are, incredibly vulnerably going to try to find a new home um, or, you know, people who are flying for the first time in, in fear. And, um, and, you know, we, we don't know what these people's lives um, are like. And so to my eye, offering a, a safe and dignified service to people in flight is not at all a selfish thing to do. Um, it's kind of the opposite of selfish. So, I, it really reconfigured the way that I think about um, the term selfish and, and how that's applied in particular to women who are pursuing things that may um, may offer them some degree of validation or may go against the patriarchal norm or, or whatever. So I think that that notion, though, that that, that concept of selfishness or, or self um, uh, something that fulfills oneself really did animate this tension between the feminist movement and stewardesses. Because that, that's that's one of the other things you cover in the book is the Vietnam War and, and Pan Am's, um, I, I say involvement in in the term that they were flying troops in and out of country, which, and you, you made that point a minute ago that they're they're seeing boys coming straight out of the jungle and onto either a flight home or an R and R flight, still muddy. Yeah, you know, that. 
I hadn't realized that, that there was this literal sort of, right, boys, you're on a break. Off you, off you go to Hong Kong or, or Bangkok or Tokyo, and you're getting straight onto a civilian airliner with these stewardesses who are seeing... With yeah. women who had no idea that they were going to be flying into an act of war exactly. zone, um, who were not hired for that, and who found out, you know, earlier that month that that their their routes included this R and R route. Yeah, totally. I mean, I had had no idea when I started doing this research either. Um, I don't think that that's very widely known, and I found it um, shocking and and really incredible that um, you know that that women would have been put in that degree of danger. Um, you know, I, I heard stories from women who had come under fire and who dealt with um, soldiers coming into going through drug withdrawal in the air um, and had to restrain them. I heard from, um, you know, a lot of different really horrific stories. And uh, I, I found it incredible to think about. And, you know, it's worth considering that, that you know, this is an era in which, you um, the draft was was going on in the U.S., and so a lot of these men who were going into the war had no choice in the matter, um, and they they did not necessarily want to be there either. So, regardless of what your perspectives on the war were um, back then or are now, um, the, these soldiers deserved um, a high level of, of sympathy and and dignity, um, in part because th- many of them were in fact protesting the war. Um, so it, it just, it was such a, a muddled situation. And, and you sort of highlight a few that, that sort of took that on as their goal to, to provide the best service for these these boys flying in and out. And they sort of made sure they based themselves on those routes. I thought that was an interesting, um, uh, I don't want to say twist, but an, an, an interesting outcome for them to see that this was their opportunity to, to help. And I, I thought that was quite touching with the, especially the Hong Kong based cruise as well in, in your book. Yeah, I found it, I found it very touching too and really inspirational. And, and, you know, I, I think it's really hard in these, um, very polarized political times to remember, um, that people are, are still people. I find it difficult sometimes. Um, but <laughs> I really tried to, to channel one of these women in my head when I'm trying to remember to be respectful while disagreeing with people. There's one other element I just wanted to chat about before we start wrapping up, which was uh, Pan Am and the airlines in general um, through the civil rights movement bringing on, because the, you know, the, 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 the classic recruitment of stewardesses, as you described in your book, are sort of white, very pale, you know, stereotypical classic beauties. But then there's the, the influx of women of color and the fantastic experience you've got there of Hazel Bowie as well, especially when she gets to Moscow as well. You know, was it difficult for a black woman to become a stewardess during this time? Was there more hoops for them to jump through or were they going through the same process as everybody else? Yeah, at, at first. So again, that's one of the things that really changed over the course of the sixties. Um, in the early sixties, like I said, under 26 at the time of hire, slim, unmarried, uh, conventionally, stereotypically white beauty. Um, black women were, were summarily just not hired. Um, even those who were very well qualified and, and in fact overqualified, um, the, the racism was really shockingly overt. Um, and, you know, to go back and read some of the, um, accounts of that racism, it, it's, it's, it makes, makes your skin crawl. Um, and then over the course of the decade, again, thanks to the EEOC, airlines were, were forced to start hiring more women of color, and they did. And again, still, these women were stereotypically very beautiful. Um, they just were of different races now. Um, and, and it was huge in, in that like, you know, it, it really did um, very much change the, the demography of flight crews um, over the course of the decade. You know, when, I, when my book begins in 1966, um, flight crews really are um, unilaterally very homogenous um, young white women. And then in 1975, when my book ends, you know, these flight crews really actually do a much better job at, at representing um, America and Americans um, and and just people. They are there are more men in the crews at that point, um, thanks to a 1972 lawsuit. There were more women of color, people of color, and they were of different ages. Um, you know, the, the the average tenure in the early and mid 60s was about two years um, because most of the women would 
quit in order to get married. And in the 1970s, it had gone up it, as soon as those that marriage regulation changed and, and the age regulation changed. Uh, women were staying on for seven, an average of seven years. And so it was very important to me to include the experiences of, of some of the, the women of color on, on Pan Am and in flight crews in general. And I was really lucky to, to meet Hazel, who's, who's just pretty awesome. Um, and I loved hearing about her her time in Moscow, which is its own fascinating moment of history to me that, um, you know, the Iron Curtain uh, is, is very strong. And the propaganda in the U.S. about um, Soviet Russia was huge. And so these women w- would go to the USSR kind of expecting this like enormously militaristic state with just great power and, and fearsome um, and and you know, that's not what they found. They found um, they, they found something very different, and they found um, that they, that they were able to really have a lot of fun with it um, in a in a very weird sort of way. So I'm trying not to go into too much detail. You should read the book if you if you want to find out about. It's what. a great bit of the book, ladies and gentlemen. Get get that going. <laughs> I I I came away uh, from reading Come Fly the World with I you know I. You know, spent ten, 10 years and more, well, 20 years in aviation and always have the greatest respect for crews because not only do I know the training, I know the passion they put into it and also the, the the trouble that they have to put up with from passengers who don't treat them the way they should. But seeing this sort of incredible moment in time that you, you've captured that was recognizable but also uh, formational for the, the experience I had was, was really quite was really quite moving for me and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But what, what have been your lasting memories since, since the book's out? Cause it's out now in paperback and you know, it's, it's been a little while you're, you're writing your next book, but when you think back about this experience, what sticks in your mind? Oh, I, you know, I started writing this book with kind of this, this desire to understand, um, you know, how these women had become who they were. And I think in in understanding them more and their individual trajectories, I think I really came, I walked away from my research for the book with a really deep um, appreciation for um, the fact that that these women really did perform kind of a, they were the missing link in a, in a way that I had not previously appreciated or understood um, between, you know, this um, era of female travel in the the 50s and 60s that was much more um, socially dicey. Uh, it was not necessarily um, socially acceptable for women to be traveling um, as in groups of women or alone or um, you know by them yeah by themselves uh, without leveraging high class status or having a chaperone or going in a group or something like that. Um, and then, you know, how I grew up, which was traveling alone at age 15 and feeling great about it. (laughs) Um, and so there, there hadn't been, I don't, there hasn't been, I I don't think enough of a recognition of what these women did, um, both in terms of structural change, right? Like, um, they did their legal, um, battles were, were, necessary for women in the workforce. Um, and, and the way that they uh, impacted the Vietnam War was huge. But also, just on a much more casual level, traveling on their own en masse um, throughout the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s did a huge service for, for those of us who grew up in the decades after that. One final question, which I've specifically not put on this list. Did you watch the Pan Am TV series? I did. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> yeah, of course I did. And you know, in my in my deepest deepest most secret, which is not at all secret, <laughs> hope had been to um to uncover uh, a Pan Am stewardess who actually was a CIA asset or agent. <laughs> um so I really I really hoped to to find that in part because that was uh in the TV show. And I just thought it would be magnificent if I could track that down in real life. Um, and I could not, I was not able to, to confirm. I found tons of like anecdotal evidence, but nothing, nothing that, that could withstand journalistic scrutiny. I was wondering when I was reading, if I was going to turn the page and there was going to be, and then there, there was this, 
this one lady who's an author degree. Oh my God, I wish. <laughs> I totally wish. I'm sure that as more government documents get declassified over the next decades, um, mm. I'm sure I'll, I'll go back and, and keep revisiting it because I'm 100% sure that that woman absolutely existed. Um, it was the, the access that these women were given in, in geopolitically um, essential places uh, was absolutely unprecedented. So uh, I'm sure that there was someone ferrying documents at the very least. If you haven't seen it, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a great TV series, but it... <laughs> it's not at all a great TV series. It's like, in fact, quite a bad TV series, but I also really enjoy bad TV. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really expect anyone to yeah. take my recommendations on what to watch on TV because my taste is not great. G gave Margot Robbie her American break. So yeah, there we go. We, we can yeah. that. <laughs> Juliet, this has been fantastic fun. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Thank you so much for having me. I can't thank Julia Cook enough for joining me here on The Damcasters. Come Fly the World really did captivate me. I found it enlightening, harrowing, and funny in places as well. And it was a pure joy to spend time with the likes of Tori and Carrot and the others. The book is out now, published by Icon Books, and is available in paperback right now from the Boney Abroad Bookshop. Check the link in our description below. If you're in the UK, you'll support us and also independent bookshops around the country. As always, if you can give us a review, that would be great. Tell your friends about us. And if you want to join the fun on Patreon, you can from just £3 a month plus that. So until next time, take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. And it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.